somebody. Light it up. Light it up. Uh, yes, let the whole world know that Jesus lives. I don't know if you saw the, you probably didn't see them, but we had some, well, what are those? Pom-pom bearers. Amen. We had some pom-pom bearers back here. Can you all step over here? You all come over here and show them your pom-poms. All right, raise them. Ra wave them. That's it. That's it. Light it up. Let the whole world know that Jesus lives. This morning, we have a lot to celebrate. We have a lot to celebrate. First of all, we'd like to celebrate Sister Kayla Landers. Is she here this morning? Kayla, where are you? Look at Kayla. Kyla, I'm sorry, Kyla. Graduated nursing school on the 13th. Light it up! Come on! Yes. We have a lot to celebrate. Now, I don't know if everybody was here when they celebrated our own nurse practitioner. Come on, Sister Robin. Light it up! Yeah. And then, today is the actual day that our pastor became the pastor of the Zion Pentecostal Church of Christ. 15 years ago. Amen. Light it up. Light it up. Come on. And we are so honored to have him as our pastor, our leader, and our beautiful first lady. We thank God for them, and we pray God's blessing over their time away from Zion, and that God will bring them back safely to us, and he will just keep them in prayer. Amen. This morning... Young people, and you too, Mark. You all know me. You know me by now. You know I like to have fun. Um, and it's good to laugh. Hold on just a second. Young people, thank you. You may all go down and sit and look this direction, amen. And you all put your hands together for them this morning. Well, it is time for us to hear the word of God coming from the man of God. I'm going to ask everyone if you will stand at this time as we receive our youth leader, Elder Brandon Lipfort, I want you to pray for him this morning and put those hands together as he comes. I know he's got a word for us. When I arrived this morning, he was outside working and I saw him and I said, Lord, have mercy. They got, they grabbed somebody this morning, a young man probably passing the church. He had his hair all tied up and a little black tie on. And I, I said, Lord, they just work everybody. They just work anybody. Well, they'll grab them. Brother Terry had all the little kids outside working hard, moving the, the tent around. I'm like, boy. I stayed in my car because I was scared. I said, Lord, let me just sit here a minute. But put those hands together this morning as we receive Elder Brandon Lipford. Amen. Come on, you put those hands together for the Lord. Give him a great, great, great praise this morning. Here I am, 
to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worth, altogether wonderful to me. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow. Here I am to say that you're my God, all together lovely, the worthy, all together one, for to me, here I am. Here I am to worship, to bow down, and to say that you're my God. You're all together love. You're all together lovely. All together, all together worthy. Together, wonderful, wonderful to me. I'll never know, I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin. See my sin. One time, everybody. Here I am to worship. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely. All together, all together worthy. We bless the name of the Lord. You may be seated, everyone, in the presence of the Lord today. Praise the Lord, everybody. It is in my, he my heart and my spirit's desire to worship the Lord this morning. And I am honored to be here with you. And very excited about our youth conference this year and what God has given to us done for us. I'm glad to see you, Kennedy, walking in the door. I'm glad to see you here. God has been tremendously good to us. And for that, we worship him. We want to give honor to our great pastor, and certainly on this day, as we uh, remember and celebrate his pastoral insulation and anniversary here. We thank God for him in his absence. Why don't we put our hands together to honor and praise our pastor and first lady, Darlene Brantley, in their absence this morning. We thank God for their tremendous leadership and pray the blessings of the Lord be with them. I want to give honor to my family. My wife is here. Angelique, Sister Angelique, and my two children, Noah Brandon Lipford and Jesse Lauren, who are both here 
we thank God for the blessing of our family. To all of our young people, thank you. Yes, that's my family. Thank you so much. To our youth choir and our youth choir director, youth director, Sister Jasmine Vincent. Everybody, please give a hand for Sister Jasmine Vincent, who is a uniquely anointed vessel of God and a tremendous leader for our young people. All of our youth that sung this morning and have participated throughout the course of the weekend, we are tremendously godly proud of you, and we thank God for your service and hope that the conference has blessed your soul and continue to bless your life. We give honor to our assistant pastor, Evangelist Wood, to our executive pastor, Elder Shepherd, to all of our ministers, to the head of our ministerial alliance, Evangelist Lining, here and continuing to pray for her family and God's strength and comfort to be with them, as well as uh, Sister Dingus, her family. We continue to pray for them and all of those who are dealing with uh, the challenges of life and uh, the mountains that we are facing, know that you have victory and that the saints of God are praying for you and believe in God to give you absolute and total victory in your life. I'm going to move into the word of God. We are attempted to accelerate the service just a bit. We want to reiterate that we're going to be transitioning from our service today. Right after the offering, we will give our benediction and a transition to our uh, what we're calling our outreach, our community fair. We do have some great things in store for you. We want you to stay. Certainly get yourself some ice cream and get yourself some good food from one of my good friends who is going to be here with his company, uh, Smoky Sweet Soul. Delicious food that will be here today. And then we're going to have some testimonies. Now, uh, there's no, uh, I don't have, haven't selected these, but we want some fiery testimonies and we're going to we're going to release them in the atmosphere. So if you have a testimony, I want you to get it and stir it up right now. So right after the service, we're going to share the story of what God has done with everyone that can hear right outside our doors. We have focused on outreach. We have focused on touching our community and evangelizing all weekend. And we're going to conclude in that same spirit this afternoon. Now, let's go into the word of the Lord today. I'm going to draw your attention First, to two passages of Scripture, and I'm going to ask you to find those with me, and then as you find them, if you would stand in reverence and deference to God's Word. The first will be found in the book of St. John, its fourth chapter. Then we're going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, which is our anchor Scripture for our conference. But first, the fourth chapter of St. John, followed by... Two verses in 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter. In St. John, we're going to begin at verse number 19, and I will read a few verses downward in your hearing. All those who are able to stand, we do ask that you would stand if you're able, and if your neighbor does not have the Bible, the Word of God, that you would share with them and be gracious and kind, that they can all hear and read from the Word of the Lord. Is everyone ready to worship? Have you come here to worship Jesus? Amen. Let us hear the word of the Lord. John 4, I'm going to begin reading at verse number 19. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such 
to worship him. Verse 28, the woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. Now, 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, two verses in your hearing, verse 6 and 7. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. The message from the Lord today is entitled, Earthen Vessels, a call for true worshipers. Earthen Vessels, a call for true worshipers. Let us pray. Blessed God, our Father, it is our honor to stand here before you this morning. Indeed, in our heart, we worship you. God, I thank you for being God. I thank you, Lord, for the anointing you have given unto us to serve you in this great hour. It is our prayer that you would preach to us this morning, and that you would stir our spirits and our hearts to worship you. We love you. We adore you. We worship you. Take complete control and move in this place. We'll honor and give you reverence forever in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. True worship manifests when and where there is the, number one, received revelation of truth and number two when the yearning of one's life is captured and consumed by the heart of the will of God I've given you a loaded statement I want to give it to you again true worship manifests when and where there is the received revelation of truth and when one's the yearning of one's life is captured and consumed by the heart of the will of God. Jesus said God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The spirit nature of God mandates that those who worship him do so in spirit and in truth. If you've got the truth, but you've got no spirit, you can't worship him. If you've got spirit without truth, you can't worship him. To worship God, there must be spirit and truth captivating your worship. You get truth by receiving revelation from God. 
When we say receiving, what we mean is that the revelation of God, that which God reveals, does not simply go to your ears. We're not talking about hearing truth. Receiving truth means that what God reveals is allowed to take root and rest in your heart, in your intellect, such that his revelation is able to transform your life. There must be the received revelation of truth. That's how you get truth. You get spirit, this spirit of worship, when the yearning or the wind of your life, when I say wind, I want you to think of that force of wind that moves what it touches in the direction it is going in. So your life has a wind, and what is driving your life, that is this yearning. You get the spirit for worship when the yearning or the wind of your life, that which is pushing, driving, and pulling you to live, is captivated by the heart of God's will. We're talking about true worship. I would like you to go with me to Ephesians Chapter number one, there are four scriptures of focus and reference for the message this morning. The first is Ephesians chapter number one. I want you to find this because I would like us to read together. Verses number three through 11. Now I will be reading from the King James Version version. If you have another version, that's all right. It should be uh, aligned and similar. But from the King James Version, would you read with me verse 3 through 11? We're talking about true worship. Let us read. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Come on. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Verse 5. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we, are, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. Two more verses. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. All right. I have taken you to this text as we continue studying true worship for a few reasons. Number one, as you will see in verse number three, the Bible says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. What we see here is God, the God of Jesus, and Jesus. Look at it again. Blessed be the God of Jesus Christ. Did you see that? Now, what we are given here is one God in two dimensions. First, the entire Bible teaches us that God is God. This we know. 
The God of the Bible is God. When we get to 1 John, uh, John, sorry, St. John, the first chapter, the Bible teaches us that Jesus Christ is that self-same God in Logos. The word Logos is a Greek word that is translated in the Bible, word, in John, John 1, 1. We see Jesus, who is that self-same God, in Logos, or in word, or, as I like to use the phrase, in dream. I use the word dream because dream speaks about what you pursue, what you desire, what is your hope, the hope of your, your mind, your thinking. The logos is the dream of God. It is what God desires. And it is that desire that calls God to make the world the way that he made it. Jesus in John 1, 1, and John 1, 14 is given to us as the self-same God in dream made flesh. The Bible says the word which was in the beginning with God and which was God, that word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Now he who dwelt among us is Jesus Christ. So when we put it together now, what we have in Ephesians 1 we have Jesus, who is that God in dream. And we have God, the God of Jesus, who is the dreamer of that dream. Stay with me now. We have one God given to us in two dimensions. This dimension, God is the dream of God. That we know is Jesus the Christ. Then we have the God of Jesus, who is the dreamer of that dream. The one that the dream came out of into the earth. This is important because as we look at Jesus' life, his life is actually God dreaming. I know it's a, it's a, it's a little philosophical. But when you look at Jesus' life, his life is defined and driven by what God is dreaming about for the earth. The totality of his life, everything that he does, and that is indeed his worship, is driven by what God is dreaming for the earth. Now, why is this significant? Why is God showing us God dreamer and God carrying the dream? It is because to accomplish his dream in the earth, it has always been from the beginning the will of God to use an earthen vessel. God has, has a dream for the earth to accomplish that dream. It has always been his will to use an earthen vessel. And so God uses this vessel to accomplish his dream. Today God is looking for Dreaming of a vessel that he can use in the earth. The Bible says, the Father seeketh. Do you understand the, the very essence of that statement that God, the all-sufficient God, is actually seeking something? That is because his will is to accomplish his dream by using an earthen vessel. It is not the will of God 
to from heaven do everything, not his will. God wants to use an earthen vessel. That again is why he's given us God of Jesus and God as Jesus. God is seeking someone who will receive his revelation of truth and who will be captivated and consumed by his dream and his heart. Now, what I just said right there was the definition that I gave you for true worship. And what that teaches us is that a true worshiper is an earthen vessel. That's what I want you to see. A true worshiper, one who receives the revelation of God's truth and who is captured by the heart of his will is an earthen vessel. It is that person that God can accomplish his dream through. Secondly, in this chapter, first, uh, Ephesians chapter 1, we see three dimensions of the will of God. In verse 5 and verse 9, we are given the good pleasure of his will. The word good pleasure or phrase good pleasure is a Greek word eudokia. It means the desire, the satisfaction, the wish, the dream of God's will. That there is a part of God's will that he does not control unilaterally. He is dreaming that we would do it for him. It is called the good pleasure of his will. There is his will, but the dimension of the good pleasure of this will is what he wants you to do for him. He doesn't control it. He desires it. He seeketh it. It is the eudokia. The second dimension, and, and I'm sorry, what I want to, that good pleasure of his will, I want you to remember as the heart of the will of God. The heart of the will of God. Verse number nine also gives us the second dimension, which is the mystery of his will. The mystery of his will is the mustari, the musteria. That's a Greek word that means the secret part. There is a dimension of God's will that is secret until he makes it known. There's some things we simply don't know that God wills to do. It is the mystery of his will. And unless he reveals it to us, we will never know it. It's a secret. Thirdly, Verse number 11 gives us the counsel of his own will. That is the word boule. The word boule means the advice, the volition. It is the head of his will. We have the good pleasure. That is the heart of his will. We have the mystery of his will. That is the hiddenness of his will. Now we have the counsel. That is the head of his will. That is what moves God to work the way he does. And you cannot know that. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. The way that God counsels his own actions, it is the counsel of his own will. Unless God gives it to us, unless God speaks it to us, and when he speaks it to us is the only way that we can know that. But God's thinking is reserved for him. So, I give you these three because as these earthen vessels, as true worshipers, our determination must be to capture the heart of the will of God. The, the, we will not always know the mystery. The mystery cannot be your focus. We won't always know it unless he says, here it is. If he never says, here it is, you can't know it. You can't build your life on that. You also cannot build your life on the counsel 
or the head of his will. Because God's thinking is far beyond our thinking. We cannot understand the complexity of all that God is doing throughout the galaxy and creation. You can't build your life or your worship on that because it's too high for you. We cannot comprehend it. But what you can capture is the heart of the will of God. The good pleasure. You can capture his dream. That you can capture. His dream is given to us in verse number 10. That in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together. There it is. He might gather together all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. The dream, the heart of the will of God is to gather everything into Jesus. That you can build your life and your worship on. It is the heart of his will. That every soul, God's dream, is to gather them into Jesus. That every kingdom, God's dream is to gather it into Jesus. In the dispensation of the fullness of time, all souls, kingdoms, times, all things, God dreams to gather them. And in order to gather them, somebody says he need an earthen vessel. Are you with me this morning? To understand this concept of an earthen vessel, we first have Jesus as an example. We are giving it to him, giving him in Ephesians 1. Jesus who is the son of God and the son of man and indeed the light of the world. We are also given this woman of Samaria. Now we return to John chapter 4. When we are studying, and again, to understand this concept of an earthen vessel, which we understand now is a true worshiper, we go to John 4. John 4 gives unto us a woman of Samaria. And this woman of Samaria meets Jesus at Jacob's well. When she meets him, she has an encounter with him that begins with him asking her to give him a drink. When she, he asks her, give me a drink, she responds under the mystery that she's living in. She's not ready to worship quite yet because she needs revelation. The mystery she responds is, Jews have no dealing with the Sumerians. Why are you even talking to me? And there are some people, whether in this house, uh, in this house, and around your community at your job, who do not believe they belong here. They don't believe they belong in the church because they look at you as something different from them. They look at you as, and you are different to a degree, but they look at you as something they don't belong to. And that's how this woman said, you shouldn't even be talking to me. Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And what is also implied, your God has no dealings with us. Your God tells you worship there. We said, we're, our fathers say worship here. Her, the mystery she's operating under will not allow her to become a worshiper. Yet, it is not until God gives her revelation. You've got to have revelation. Today, even right now, you've got to have revelation of who you really are. Not who you believe that you are. Not who you believe that you have been born to be. You need revelation of who you are to God. Glory to God. She didn't even believe that she belonged in a conversation. Yet, not, not even in the conversation, 
much less the hand of God. So the mystery that she's operating under won't allow her to see the connection she is supposed to have with Jesus or the God of Jesus. That's number one. We're, le we're learning about an earthen vessel. Number two, she has the stuff to become a true worshiper. This is because she is capable of being earthen. Everybody say earthen. Earthen. She is able to be earthen. Now earthen means clay. The, the Greek word earthen means clay. It means that there is a humility. There is a fragile, a fragility about the earthen vessel. The earthen vessel Earthen vessels are not the steel, the gold, the plated that are up on the pedestal. Those aren't the earthen vessel. The earthen vessel is the common vessel that the, that the master uses continuously. There's a fragility. It can break. It, it, can, it can be broken. It might have a chip on the top or on the bottom. The earthen vessel. This woman has the stuff to become a worshiper because she's able to be earthen. When we learn about earthen vessels, you and I must be able to preserve our earthenness. What I'm talking about is you, you can't be so shiny. You can't appear so polished. You can't believe that you're so fine that God can't use you. If Listen, God don't want to look at earthen, look at vessels. God needs a vessel he can use. So that he can get his dream accomplished. God's not trying to look at people on a shelf. God didn't save you to look at you. God wants to use you. So if you're going to be a usable vessel, you can't be a china cup on the, on the pedestal sitting there on the display case just wanting to be seen by the guest. You got to be the vessel that, that, that God, can, God can take a drink and what and put you in the dishwasher and let you go through the cycle and be, be cleaned and, and then let you fall down on the, on, the, on the ground. God's got to be able to use you. That's why you've got to be, preserve your earthenness. Now, this woman shows us how to do it because in the conversation that she has with Jesus, Jesus begins to talk about her life. He speaks to her that I have a water, a fountain that I, I will give to the one that comes to me and drink, and he will never thirst again. She immediately says, Lord, give me this water. Why? That I thirst no more and come here no more. She recognizes I need something. There's a thirst that I can't satisfy. Every day I have to come here and get water. I got to get more water. Why? Because I'm thirsty again. After I drink, I, I, I get thirsty again. I need something. I need something. Earthen vessels recognize that they need God. I ne no, I don't just like you. I don't just want you. I need you. There's something in my life that cannot be satisfied. I come here every day. I come here every Sunday because I can't, I can't be satisfied because I need something. If you're going to be an earthen vessel, you've got to stay acquainted with your need. For God, she says, give me this water. When he said, then they, con they continue. He says, he, she says, so I don't have to come here and drink. He says, go call your husband. Let him come get the water. She said, with no hesitation, I don't have a husband. Yes, I'm a woman. I don't have a husband. Jesus said, you spoke truly. Truly, you were honest about your life with me. And you told me I don't have a husband. Jesus said, that's right, you've had five. And the one that you're with now, he's not your husband. This is what happened. You don't have five husbands because you don't want a husband. You have five husbands because you're looking for a husband. But it don't work out. You're after something, but it's not working out. It just didn't work out. So I tried another man. It didn't work out. 
and she says it without hesitation. I don't have one. I would like one, but I don't have one. So I'm earthen. I'm just a regular woman. It ain't all working out all the time. What will hinder you from becoming a worshiper, a true worshiper, is this facade that it's all okay. If you come in the church, if you wake up in the morning, and I'm good, I'm cool, I'm all right, I don't need them, I'm, I'm, I'm all right, I can keep going on my, my very way, my life is the way it should be, you can't be a true worshiper. You got to be earthen. You got to be able to understand and confess it's not all working out the way I want it to work out. I need something more than what I have. Because what I have, it ain't working out. You got to worship him in truth. Now, this is the thing. What we often, some of us, would think is a disqualifier is actually appealing to God. See, we think, some of us think, get your life together. Get your life together. And we think that's what makes God want to use us. Oh, he got everything together. Hey, God's going to use him. That ain't what God said. God's not looking for that. Because you can't come to God already ready. God's got to make you ready. So God's not looking for nobody coming in here like I got it all together. God don't looking for that. God's looking for somebody that says, I need you to breathe. I, I, got, I need you to live. I, I need you. I, I can't think without you. If I don't worship you, I'm going to lose my mind. I need you to live. If you want to be a, a worshiper, you got to confess, I need you, Jesus. God's not looking for no polished vessel that thinks they're already ready. Just put me on the shelf. You're not ready. Because God does not take manufactured vessels. God calls people and makes them into vessels. God is looking for somebody that has a yearning on the inside. Somebody say yearning. Hey, they got a yearning. They yearn to be used. They, they yearn to be out, out of the cabinet and set on the table. They yearn for God to touch them and lift them and, and take a drink from them. And they, they yearn to be used. They want to leave church uh, sweaty and, and their shirt off. Most of, and somebody say, what happened to you? And you say, God, God happened to me. What, what, why are you all disheveled? God was using me this morning. He was using me. I'm sweaty. I, I, when I leave church, when I, leave, when I walk in, when I, when I go home for the evening, I'm spent. I'm busted. Somebody say, what happened to you? God happened to me. God, he picked me up and he, he used me and he, he poured out of me. And then he scooped me up and filled me back up. Then he took a drink out of me. And then he shared me with somebody else. He used me. God used me. God's looking for somebody that he yearns to be used. I want to be used. I want to be used for your dream, for what's in your heart. That's what captures me. True worshipers don't want to use God. They want God to use them. God is looking for vessels that yearn to be filled with his treasure. And he yearned to prove worthy to be on his table and in his presence. And who recognize that they are fragile. And without his touch of care, they will be destroyed. This woman had the stuff of earthenness. And though this encounter, rather through this encounter with Jesus, she was made into an earthen vessel. Catch it. She didn't come as a true worshiper. But the encounter with Jesus calls her to be made into a worshiper, into an earthen vessel. And how do we see this? What happens is 
when Jesus reveals God's dream, he says to her, the Father seeketh worshipers. He's seeking certain kind of people to worship him. That's what he wants. That's the heart of his will. He's seeking it. He's seeking it. When, God get, when Jesus gives her that revelation, she left her water pot. What, what, what she was doing before, she left it. She left her water pot, and she said, that's what he's dreaming? I, I know some people that have been looking for the Messiah. And, and she runs into the city and says, come see a man. Come. He's the, he's the one that we've been yearning for. Come. She turns into an earthen vessel. She turns into someone who is captured by his dream. You told me what he's dreaming about, and it captures her. She drops her water pot, and she's driven into the city, and she evangelizes. Says, come, 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 and she brings them out of the city to the Lord. Why? Because that's what God wanted. That's what God was dreaming about. She didn't do it just because she wanted to do it. It came from worship. The reason I'm doing it is because I know that's what you want. You have given me revelation and my real revelation truth plus the spirit that you have put in me. The wind that you have put in my soul to do your will cause me to become a worshiper who can worship you in spirit and in truth. Somebody clap your hands this morning. She went to gather. Yes, Lord. She went to gather and to bring God's people who, to bring God people who had a yearning. Hallelujah. Pause one second. There is somebody that God's sending you to that has a yearning for God. They got the right stuff. They have the stuff to become a, a true worshiper. And God is seeking true worshiper. If God told you, if God told you, Elder Moore, all I want out of my life is him. Would you spend your life playing basketball? Would you spend your life trying to make money? If you're a true worshiper, your whole life turns to getting him to God. That's it. If God said, that's what I want. That's all I want from you, Dennis. I, that's all I want from you. You got to ch leave your water pot. I don't care what you're doing with your life. Drop your water pot. Only thing that matters is what God wants. God said, all I want is him. All I want is him. I want him. I want him. All I want is 142nd. I want everybody on this street. Yeah. Who's going to go get him? Who's going to go get him? He said, God said, I, I want everybody on 141st. I want every house, every child. Who's going to go get them for me? That's what true worship is. That's true worship. It's not a song. True worship is being captured by his heart. Hallelujah. Now, the worship of a vessel. I'm, 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 I'm way over time. I got to go. The worship of a vessel. The, se the third scripture. Go, to me, go with me to Luke chapter 14. We're going to wrap up here. Luke chapter 14. God put me right to the page. Yes, Lord. God's right here. He's in this. God's right in this room tonight, this morning. God is here right now. I worship you, Jesus. I worship you, Lord. I bless your name. The worship of a vessel. It is important to note and recognize that God does not mass manufacture worshipers in the earth what I told you before God calls people he don't make he doesn't manufacture worshipers he calls people and when people answer his call he molds them and shapes them into worshipers unto him and this molding and making process is what God does in us to fit us for ministry he, he molds us to fit us for ministry. Now, this ministry is what we would call vessel ship. 
I'm going to call that today. Vesselship. It is a servanthood. It is a ministry unto God. And we learn about that in Luke chapter 14. I'm going to just quickly summarize this. The servant's ministry that we learn in Luke 14 is urgent. The Bible says that Jesus puts before them this account of a certain man that made a supper. He made, everybody say supper. It's not breakfast. It's not lunch or brunch. It's supper. Remember what he said in Ephesians. The dream will be accomplished in the dispensation of the fullness of time. Time. He makes a supper. It's not breakfast. There's no more meals. It's supper time. Open your ears, everybody. It's supper time. It's supper time. The light is fading. The, the, the vessel, the ministry of vesselship has to understand it's supper time. It's almost over. The, it, you got, we got to save them as quickly as humanly possible. It's, it's supper time. It's supper time. The, the dispensations of the fullness of time is how God will cause the dream to come true. When we're in the supper time, he says to his servants, go tell everybody that was invited the supper's ready. All of those people dismiss the urgency of the time. They start doing things they could do later, but they do it now. They don't recognize the supper is only now. You can't, they say, I'm going to go and look at the, the land that I bought. I'm going to go and see my new wife. You can do that tomorrow. But this invitation into God's presence, this invitation into God's kingdom can only happen right now. I'm talking to somebody right now who is not saved. And listen to me, you got to be able to say you're not saved if you're going to be saved. You can't be telling me right now, oh, I am saved, Elder Brandon. I'm all right. If you're not saved, you're not saved. And that means if Jesus returns today, you're not going to be ready. And it's supper time. So you got to be saved now. So don't dismiss the invitation of God because this won't last always. Stop thinking, I'm going to come next week. You might not be able to come next week. It's supper time. Are you hearing me? You can't start doing stuff that you can do later when God says, I need you to come right now. And the servants of God, the vessels, must understand this. Jesus said, the, the, the man says, go out quickly. It's in verse number 21. After those people reject, he says, go out quickly. Somebody say quickly. Somebody say quickly, Zion. Quickly, Zion. Go out quickly. Are y'all hearing me? Supper time. Go out quickly. And you might think, I'm not, I'm not an evangelist. That's not me. You're operating under the mystery. Don't you tell God what you are or what you're not. If you are his vessel, you got to let him use you for whatever he want to use you for. That means that it, though it's uncomfortable, you got to go out quickly. He says go out quickly because it's, su it's supper time. And secondly, the vessels must acquaint themselves with the cost. The cost. After, after that that story about the supper, Jesus, the Bible says there were great multitudes that followed him. And these great multitudes that followed him, many of them were there because every now and then he would give you a free fish dinner. Every now and then he would do something amazing. He'd, he'd give you a show. Every now and then Jesus would just do something. So people would just follow him for the show and for the free snacks. They, they just loved it. That's what they loved. But one time Jesus, the Bible said, turn. Serious now. Yeah, how many people in church? You come to church, you walk in, you walk in with Jesus. But when Jesus turns, serious now. The Bible says he turned and he said, if any of you don't hate your mother, your father, your children, your life, for my sake, you can't be my disciple. 
I'm drawing a line right here. All the fanfare is over. Oh, I, oh, I, I, I'm going to do some more miracles. But I don't want you to be confused that just because you're walking behind me. Serious now. He turns to them. He says, if any of you won't pick up your cross, carry it. You can't be my disciple. You can, you can stay in the crowd. I'm not going to kick nobody out the crowd, but you can't be my disciple. You cannot be my vessel. So, the, the vessel must stay acquainted with the cost of this. There's a cost to be really one of us. And I say one of us, I mean the believers. There's a cost. You can't just sit on the sidelines. It's not up to you to do it how you want to do it. If you are a vessel of worship, you belong to him. There's a cost. And this is why the cost is so important. Because the cost of making something is what determines its value. That's how you got, when he gets to the end, he says, salt is good. But if the salt has lost his savor, it's good for nothing. What he's saying is, the value of the salt will go away if the savor is lost. But how do you keep savor? The value, the savor comes from the cost of making you. You get it? The most expensive item is the one it costs the most to make. It's the, it's the materials that go into that bag that make it cost so much. What makes your ministry is what is your savor. If you, if you want a free salvation that don't cost you nothing, okay, but you ain't going to be worth nothing. You can't have a savor without a cost of manufacturing. Are y'all with me? If you don't go through it, if, you don't, if you're not acquainted with the cost, if you're not lifting up the cross every day, if you're not carrying the banner of Jesus' name, there's nothing in you. There's no savor in the salt because it's cheap. It ain't cost nothing to make you. You just put on your clothes and you came to church. But it didn't cost nothing to get you here. There's no savor in there. And so because there's no savor, it's good for nothing. You're just following. You're just in the crowd. But you're not his disciple. I, I'm sorry. I want you to be lifted, but I had to tell you. There's a cause Jesus turned and he looked at them. If you're going to be a vessel, if you're going to be a vessel, you've got to have value on the inside. And that value comes from praying, worshiping, and lifting up the cross and telling somebody about Jesus and recognizing that it, it won't always be easy to be his disciple. But you pay the cost because you want to worship him. Now, we're at the finish because the savor is the treasure that we have in these earthen vessels. The savor is the treasure. The treasure is the dream of God. It is the revelation you know what God wants. That's the treasure. You know what he wants. You know how to please him. He wants to gather together all things. The treasure that you carry on the inside is Jesus. The treasure that you carry on the inside is Jesus. He says, when you carry your cross and you follow me, you will become like me. 
That's how I will put myself in you. So the treasure that's in you is me. You have Jesus. You have the healer. You have the deliverer. You have the answer. On the inside, you have Jesus. You got Jesus. When you see that man on the street, you got Jesus inside of you. Just pour it out. Just pour him out. Just pour him out. Pour out Jesus to the world. Pour him out. You got the treasure on the inside. But the Bible says if our gospel or if our treasure be hid, it's hid to those that are lost. It's hid to the ones that are perishing. Now, how is it hidden? It's hidden when it's veiled. It's veiled. What happened? That, that scripture, is, it succeeds what they were talking about Moses. When Moses got the first revelation, they had, he put a veil over his face. The people couldn't see him because they felt what he was carrying was too far from them. Veil it. But the problem is that veil remains on their hearts. It continues to blind them because they cannot see the earthiness of the treasure. How is the gospel veiled? It's veiled when the saints that carry the treasure aren't earthen enough. It is when the humility and the honesty of your worship can't be seen. It's when we, we're just sitting in the church and we're just comfortable. And, yeah, it's all good. Everything is all good. And somebody says, I, well, those people are great, but I can't see, G I can't see Jesus. I, I don't see Jesus. I see the polish of you, but I don't see Jesus. Because there's no earth in this, he is veiled. They will see you, but they don't, if they really saw your earth in this, they would see your worship like this. Oh, Lord, I bless you. I bless you. And they would see Jesus. Somebody would see Jesus. When you say, I can't, I need you, Lord. I need you to live. And they say, oh, that's Jesus. He's the one that makes them yearn. He's the one that pulls them. Their life, he makes them. That's the yearning. You got to remain earthen, everybody. You got to remain earthen. You got to remain humble. You got to remain hungry. You got to keep a yearning for Jesus, for his will to be done. And when somebody sees you yearn, that's when they will see see the light on the inside of you. They will see they're not all together, but they're victorious. He says we're troubled on every side, yet not perplexed. We're in despair. Well, we're, we're, well, wait, I gotta read it. I gotta read it. Hallelujah to God. He says we're troubled on every side, but we're not in despair. We're broken. We're cast down, but we're not destroyed. You see, it's the earthenness. You can only see Jesus through earthen vessels. I'm broken, but I still bless him. I'm broken, but I need him, and I worship him with all my soul and my heart and my spirit. I bless him. And listen, I'm not perfect, but I came to tell you about Jesus. He's a good God. He will change your life. If you just come, come see a man. He'll change everything. Come see a man. He'll change everything. He's working on me. He's working on me right now. No, I'm not perfect. I don't have everything together, but that's why I need him. Come, come, come with me. It's the earth in this, the earth in vessels. God's looking for an earthen vessel this morning. God's looking for a vessel that yearns to be used and will stay earthen. They will stay humble. They will stay submitted to his will. They'll do whatever he called them to do. I don't care what I used to be. What does your mystery reveal about me right now? I'm a preacher today. That woman came to the well to get water and she ran away an evangelist. You don't know what God has for you. You don't know what God wants to do with you. Open your mouth and tell somebody about Jesus. Open your mouth and preach. Preach your testimony. Tell somebody. 
Lord. Yes, Lord. Tell somebody he's a good God. Tell somebody he changes everything. There's nothing he can't handle. He handled me. There's nothing he can't handle. Let God use you. God's looking for an earthen vessel. And that's what regeneration is all about. What you have lost, recapture it today. What you have lost, recapture it today. Somebody needs to just go into a, a intense worship. Like you first got saved, you need to be regenerated because God needs you to be captured by his wind again. Somebody needs to stretch their hands farther than you ever stretched them before because you got to worship him. Come on. Come on. It's a regeneration. God said start over. God said be born again. Recapture your fire. Get out into the street and, and tell somebody Jesus is alive. Recapture what you used to be. Um, empower yourself again. Charge yourself up again. And say, I'm going out into the street. I'm knocking on every door. Come out. Come see Jesus. I'm knocking on every door. I'm telling everybody I can. He's alive. He's alive. Jesus saves. He saves. He wants you. He wants you. He wants you. Clap your hands, everybody, and praise him. It's a regeneration. It's a regeneration. God needs you to regenerate. He needs you to recapture your, learn, your yearning love for him and his will. I want to be used. I want to leave out of here this sanctuary busted and broke down because I praised him with my heart. I, I danced out of my clothes. I sweat out my good suit. I blessed his name because he used me. And that's all I live for. I live to be used by God. And we do it because we worship him. Last thing I'm going to tell you, saints. The apostle ends that chapter by saying, Though our outward man perish, our inward man is renewed day by day. Though I bear the cross and the cross almost weighs me down, there's another, Jesus said there's another food that I have. That food is to do the will of him that sent me. I'm not living. God's not looking for somebody that wants it easy all the time. You can't be a worshiper. You got to want to bear the cross. Oh, God. You got to want to bear the cross. You got to want to feel the pressure. You got to want to feel the pain. Sometimes of being like Jesus. You got to want to go out and be sweating because you're evangelizing in 90 degree weather. But it's because you worship Jesus. I'm doing it for God. I'm doing it because he wants, he wants him. And I'll do anything that it takes to get him to God. We do it because God dreams of it, and that's what true worship is all about. I'm going to leave you right here, saints, but it's time to be an earthen vessel. You got the treasure. You got the light. You are the light of the world. You got to go out quickly because it's supper time and tell somebody, come see a man. Come see a man. Come see a man that told me everything. Come and see a man that will save you and your entire family. That will change your life forever. Come. Come see a man. And whatever it takes his servant said Lord it's full yet there is room we went and got him and there's one there's more room we can get one more tell somebody next to you we can get one more we can get one more we can get one more don't get tired on me saints I know I'm going too long but listen don't get tired on me tell somebody next to you we can get one more we can get one more they were so captured by what God said. They said, we can get one more. There's room still, Lord. There's room still, Lord. He said, fill my house. And they went out and got everybody. 
And they said, we can get more. Would you tell us to go out again, Lord? We're your servants. We're just waiting on your word. Tell us to go out again. And they went out again. They said, we can, get, we can get one more. We can get one more. You can get one more. You can get one more. You can get somebody to sit next to you. You can get somebody to sit next to you. You can get another singer. You can get another dreamer. You can get another preacher. They're right out there. They're right out there. They're right out there. You see them every day. They're all over the place. Go get them. Go get them quickly. The maimed, the, the broken, the poor, the whole. Go get them. Bring them in and let, let God's dream be fulfilled. God bless you, saints. God bless you in Jesus' name. Let's be earthen vessels for the Lord and bless him and worship him and go get the world and let them know Jesus is alive. Come on, clap your hands and praise him. Come on, clap your hands, everybody, and give God a great praise. Hallelujah. 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 Bless his name. Bless the name of Jesus. There's room at the cross for you this morning. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Put your hands together for the word of God this morning. Hallelujah. Bless the name of Jesus. Ah, yes. Hallelujah. If there's someone here this morning that desires to be saved, you don't know the Lord in the pardon of your sins, you may come this morning. You may come this morning. Come and dine, the mask calleth. You can feast at Jesus' table all the time. He who fed the multitude and turned the water into wine, to the hungry calleth now, come and dine. If you're here this morning, you don't know the Lord in the pardon of your sins, come on down, come on. There's room at the cross for you, come on, come on. That's it. This is youth day. All of you should be coming this direction. That's right, young lady. We're glad to have you here this morning. Oh, uh, yes. Come on. Come on. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. Yes, there's room at the cross. For you. Come on. If there's someone that desires prayer, there's room at the cross for you this morning. At the cross for you. Come on, come on. There's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, though, though millions have come, there is still room for one. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. Come on, this morning. There's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. everyone to stand. Everyone stand, please. Come on, children. You can still come. What Elder Brandon was telling us this morning, 
that God wants earthen vessels. That's you. But you have to have the ability to be used by God. You have to want to be used by God. So you have to say, Lord, I surrender all. I, I, I give you my all. Whatever you want me to do, however you want me to do, wherever you want me to go, send me. I'll go. Because there's room at the cross for each and every one of you. Hallelujah. And we praise God for that. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you this morning. Oh, God, we pray this morning that you would touch, heal, save, deliver. There's somebody here this morning that wants more of you. Hallelujah. So we pray that you would hear our prayer, oh, God. Incline thine ear to us and grant us that which is pleasing in your sight. Let everything that we say, everything that we do, let it be done for your glory. Let it be done for your honor. And Lord, right now there are some that are sick among us. And we pray Hallelujah. that you would touch their bodies in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Make us what you want us to be. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And let your will be done in each and every life that's in this building within the sound of our voices today. We pray now that you would bless your people. Bless them in ways they can't even imagine. From the crown of their heads, Lord, to the very soles of their feet. You said that you would open up the windows of heaven and pour us out a blessing that we don't even have room enough to receive, but let us receive all that we can in the mighty name of Jesus. And we will praise you. We will give you honor. We will give you glory. Hallelujah. And the people of God say amen. 